Welcome to this video and we're going to cover the Republican presidencies of McKinley, Roosevelt and Taft. We're going to be able to describe the turmoil of the 1890s, look back at the populist movement and look forward to the progressive movement and evaluate the presidencies of the Republicans in this time. So an overview of what we covered last video, we looked at the rise of populism, you know, we've got the big business, corruption and exploitation of the 1890s and how that leads people towards the support of populism. When populism really comes to fruition with the election of uh, William Jennings Bryan as the Democrat nominee, although he loses the election, it, it demonstrates that populism is still a growing movement. After he loses that election and the subsequent election of 1896, we see the fall off of the populist party, which leads to the rise of progressivism. Now, progressivism is similar, but also different. And in the next slide, we'll look at the similarities and the differences between the two beliefs. It's a, populism is a, a fading force in this period. We've got the election of uh, Roosevelt as vice president to McKinley. When McKinley is assassinated, we look at the uh, progressive policies of TR and then Taft as his successor before finally we're going to start looking at the election of Wilson who is truly a progressive uh, president. What is progressivism? What is it? It is a wide-ranging movement of discontent. It is in the middle classes in the urban areas of America and that's very different to populism which was very much focused in the rural areas as a result of the agricultural discontent as well as big business. Uh, progressivism really is about reforming the political corruption, regulating big businesses. It has support for female suffrage and women's rights. It believes in higher public morality, and we will look at the uh, creation of the Anti-Saloon League and Prohibition. It also has as a fundamental core belief the protection of workers' rights and the protection of the environment. And those really are the criteria that we can start to assess the presidents by when we look at how progressive they are. All of these uh, were radical at the time. It really did divide the country from conservatives on the right-hand uh, side of the spectrum to the left-hand side where we've got progressive policies and at the extreme end we've got socialism. America is a divided country politically at this time, certainly by ideology anyway. Um, progressive, progressives start to emerge in both sides of the parties, so we look at Democrats and Republicans and later we've got the creation of a national progressive uh, league as well. Our first president is William McKinley, number 25, fought for the Union in 1865, becomes president in 1896. He defeats William Jennings Bryan um, rather successfully and again in 1900, so he's elected twice. He's a Republican conservative um, and in 19, 1896 that is the predominant uh, belief at the time. They're not quite ready for the election of William Jennings Bryan who is very progressive. The economy's growing and he's very successful. He's a believer in protection and tariffs and sort of drags the party to the right-hand side of the spectrum at that time. He's assassinated in 1901. Now, to balance the ticket, he selects as vice president Theodore Roosevelt. And when he's assassinated, Roosevelt takes over. Now, the balance of the ticket is in reference to the idea that Theodore Roosevelt is more to the left. He's more progressive in his policies and can garner support from the people for those reasons. And on the right-hand side, the conservative spectrum is McKinley. That's not to say that he wasn't progressive, and certainly we can analyse and evaluate his presidency um, doing so. Now, he did pass much legislation that pleased big business. We've got the Dingley Tariff. We've got the Currency Act. Those are conservative policies that support protection and tariffs uh, and in favour of big business. Remember, when we talk about protectionism and tariffs, it means we can't buy from overseas. And if we can't buy from overseas, we have to buy American, and that might mean that we're paying more for our products. Now, that's good for big business because it forces people to buy your products, but it's bad for average person because they can't buy things from other over overseas when they may be cheaper. But he did do some progressive things. He chose Theodore Roosevelt as vice president. He condemned lynchings publicly for the first time. This is a president speaking out about the actions in the South. He creates an independent arbitration board for labour disputes. It's no longer big business that's going to resolve the problems uh, between its labour force and its policies. It will be an independent board. He meets with Booker T. Washington at the Tug uh, Tuskegee Institute for the first time and he supports progressives and he's supported sorry, by progressives such as Wilson. Wilson called him uh, a turning point of their time. So there must be some element of truth in saying that McKinley can be considered just at the cusp of the change from conservative to progressive policies. 
He's assassinated in 1901 by a Polish, German and anarchist, Leon uh, Sagolsk. He wins election in 1900 by a landslide. He would have been a more successful and perhaps we'd have seen more progressive policies at the time. <coughs> Number 26 is Theodore Roosevelt, who as vice president takes over, former governor of New York. He's radical and interventionist and he's known as the wild cowboy, the cowboy or the damned cowboy by his party. The conservative wing of republicanism are very suspicious of him. And in fact, Mark Hanna, you know, the big supporter of William McKinley, who raised so much money and was instrumental in his victory, decides to challenge him in 1904. But does, uh, fortunately, or unfortunately for him, fortunately for Theodore Roosevelt, dies before he could do so. Now, Theodore Roosevelt's policies are known as the square deal. That's what he campaigned on from his bully's pulpit, which is what he called the presidency. He was able to fight for workers' rights, for females' rights, for the environment from this pulpit. He fought corruption as police commissioner in New York City, and that's where he gains his reputation as this radical, this interventionist. He publicly condemns the wealthy criminal class. That's in reference to Andrew Carnegie, uh, Vanderbilt, and, Roose and um, Rockefeller. He, there's much evidence of his uh, sort of campaigns to break down large trusts. You've got the creation of northern securities. He blocks it. The Bureau of Corporations, which is a, a government um, wing designed to stop and evaluate uh, large corporations, re-elected by a landslide in 1904. And that's when we start to see his uh, slide towards even more extreme progressive policies. 1906 Hepburn Act, the Antiquities Act. His lasting legacy is the creation of 193 million acres of national forests, up from just 20 million and five new national parks. 1906, we've got the Meat Inspection Act. That's in um, sort of as a result of investigations into uh, meat packing in Chicago and public uproar at the, at the terrible conditions that their food was being distributed in. And it's the start of government regulation of sort of big business and industries. Again, when you look at this, none of these policies are new to us. This is what we'd expect from a president, expect from a government. But at the time, they are radical and they annoy very many people. On the other hand, it's not to say that he was as progressive as Wilson when we start to evaluate him. He publicly denounces socialists and populists. He calls them pinheads and cranks. He is moderate towards race relations. He invites uh, uh, Booker T. Washington to the presidency uh, once to the White House. When there is a lot of uproar towards that, he doesn't do it again. He fails to intervene in the South as there is a lack of political will and he doesn't direct his policies towards that. He is, when we look at foreign policy, very interventionist, and his motto was walk softly. Let's walk softly and carry a big stick. Now, he handpicks his uh, sort of successor, really. He decides not to run for a third term, as he, was a, uh, he becomes president in 1901 and serves as president for three years. He considers that his first term, and from 1904 to 1908, he considers that his second term. It's a decision he will regret. William Taft is very different from Roosevelt, but they were very good friends. Whereas Roosevelt was very outgoing and charismatic and bullied as a president, Taft preferred a much quieter existence. And we see this in his policies. He wants to become uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and eventually achieves that aim after his presidency in 1921. The conservative wings of the Republican Party are very positive towards his selection. He also chooses a vice president that's conservative and he seems poised to backtrack on Roosevelt's reform and we can evaluate whether he did that later. So we've seen this swing from conservative to progressive and perhaps we're going to see it swing backwards to conservative. But we don't. When we dig deeper into Taft actually we see quite a progressive um, president. He's got a low-key approach to antitrust. He takes large-scale action against US Steel in, all, in over his presidency, there's over 80 antitrust suits against big business. That's almost double the amount that Roosevelt took. He empowers the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission to set railroad rates. Uh, there are constitutional amendments that allow for a federal income tax, which is a very progressive policy, you know, taxing um, the very wealthy in order to pay for the government actions rather than use the tariffs and the money that's generated by those which people pay. And he chooses to elect directly senators by the people rather than by uh, the local states, which again is a progressive policy. Handing back power to the people is progressive. Ensuring that big business doesn't dominate 
workers' rights and labour rights, is progressive, choosing to empower the ICC to ensure that monopolies and trusts don't form and cartels, is progressive. He's a progressive president, but he chooses to align himself with the conservative wing of the uh, Republican Party. He chooses a vice president that's conservative. He calls, he convenes a large group to decide about tariffs, and that leads to the decision for the Payne Aldrich Act. It's protectionist, it's anti-progressive, and he signs it in law. And this angers the progressive wing of the party, and they move towards the Democrats, and certainly the um, Progressive National League is created as a result of it. He sacks Pinchon, who's a leading member of Roosevelt's Forest Service, he chief, and that pleases big business. So he has sort of a very balanced presidency. We can see that he's progressive in some of his policies, but yet some of the things that he does support big business and provide for a, a better chance for them. This all culminates in the 1912 election, and it's tumultuous. It's something exciting. Progressive wing of the Republicans, led by Senator La Follette, uh, organise a new National Progressive League. They want to drag the party back to the progressive policies of Roosevelt. They're angered by Taft. The progressives join with the Democrats and select Wilson as a candidate. And Wilson is a progressive uh, president. He campaigns on a progressive platform. This causes Roosevelt to make a political comeback. He said he wasn't going to run for a third term and he comes out of retirement. He loses the Republican National Convention closely to Taft and Taft will go on to run as Republican candidate for the presidency as the sitting president. He then, Roosevelt then splits from the party and wins nomination from the National Progressive Party, which is also called the Ball Moose Party. And he forces out Senator Le Follette um, in order to become the leader. The 1912 election means the Republican support is split. We've got conservative Republicans voting for Taft. We've got progressive Republicans voting for uh, Roosevelt and we've got progressive Democrats and conservative Democrats voting for one candidate and that's Wilson. He wins by landslide. The domination of the Republican Party in the USA is over at least temporarily and we're going to look at the election of Wilson in more detail in the next video and here's a diagram just to indicate just how significant his victory was. Wilson wins 435 votes, he carries 40 states. Roosevelt, by splitting that party, wins 88 votes in six states, and Taft, as president, loses dramatically and historically. He wins eight votes and just two states. When we look at the number of votes, though, it's very different. We've got Wilson at 6.2, Roosevelt at 4, Taft at 3, and then Debs, who's a socialist candidate, at 0.9. So we can see that had Roosevelt or Taft won the nomination and no second party had been created, it may have been a different result. But it's also telling that we've got this Socialist Party candidate, the fourth candidate, an independent Debs, winning almost a million votes. So we can see just how progressive America's politics is becoming at this time. At the extreme end of the left wing, we've got Socialism. On the left of centre, we've got progressivism, and on the right of centre, we've got the Republican typical candidates, conservatism. And we can see that America at this time clearly is not divided. When we assess McKinley, Roosevelt and Taft about um, progressivism, it's important to have that balance and to say, McKinley, yes, he's conservative, but there were some progressive ideas. We can see that he's the starting point for this movement. Roosevelt, yes, he's clearly progressive, but... There were some elements of his presidency that were conservative or he maybe didn't do enough perhaps he would have done in a third term but we can't make that judgment yet and taft who was criticized by roosevelt as being too conservative you know it broke up their friendship and it would never recover until 1918 before his death taft yes he's conservative but yet there are some elements of his presidency that are progressive and in fact when we're dealing with trusts he does more than roosevelt so overall this period we see the emergence of the progressive movement in America and we can see the divide that it causes. Next lesson, next video we'll be covering Woodrow Wilson. Thank you.